This is second lecture, Wednesday, April 22nd, talking about polar ecosystems, specifically talking about the Arctic. We saw what it's like in the, talking about the Antarctic, rather. We're, we already looked at conditions in the Arctic, saw that there's this really strong seasonal productivity and a lot of behaviors of the animals in relation to that seasonality. So let's turn our attention to the Antarctic. In the Antarctic, there is a very high productivity, longer periods of time, and as we saw when we were looking at crustaceans, there's this one crustacean, these little shrimp-like crustaceans called euphausids or krill, and these krill are present in huge numbers, gigantic numbers of these krill. They're capable of feeding on on uh, zooplankton, which feeds on the phytoplankton. And there is some seasonality to this, but during the really cold time of the year, these zooplankton can even feed on bacteria that's embedded in the ice. If they have some mechanisms for holding themselves over during the less productive times of the year. And you've got the continental shelf, remember? You've got upwellings, you have some conditions for delivering nutrients up to the surface that you don't have in the Arctic. But this, these krill provide a huge amount of energy for all kinds of different organisms all up the food chain until you get the big, giant fish, birds, mammals, uh, a huge amount of food. And there's also invertebrates that eat these. Even seals eat these. So this is a, a huge component of the Antarctic ecosystem is these krill, and it's very important for supporting all these animals above it. So let's look at the mammals, seabirds, and fishes that you find there. We'll look at baleen whales. We'll look at toothed whales. We'll look at birds, just like we did in the Arctic. So for the baleen whales, these are some of the biggest whales in the world, some of the biggest whales in the ocean, the biggest animal to ever live on earth and, and according to some estimates the blue whale the blue whale is huge there's also humpback whales that go down south just like they go up north to the arctic fin whales and these are filter feeders that are capable of engulfing very large amounts of food and there's very large amounts of food for them to engulf with this krill especially so they go along feeding and they can, they can ingest a huge amount of food in a short period of time. It's a really good place to be in the summer and storing up all this energy. And then in terms of reproduction, you move closer to the equator, give birth there, and you've got a lot of energy. You don't need to eat nearly as much, if at all, when you move to the equator because you've stored up so much energy from this very, very abundant food in the summertime. Toothed whales. Now, toothed whales, there's, uh, you don't have narwhals, you don't have beluga whales, so you have toothed whales that come down there and they leave, as opposed to these more constant occupants. Like in the Arctic, where beluga whales and narwhals, they hardly go anywhere. So you've got sperm whales, they're uh, abundant down there, a lot of food. To feed on but they seasonally migrate you've got killer whales with uh, a lot of food for them to feed on as well two important toothed whale species that undergo some seasonal migration so it's a little different in terms of the constancy of the toothed whales that are there now in terms of birds you have some of the terns and you have skuas and you have birds like that these seasonal migrators but of course, the claim to fame for, for the Antarctic in terms of birds is penguins. 17 species of penguins, as a number of you have pointed out during the semester. You guys have you've gotten some enjoyment out of seeing how many different species of different things there are, turtles and penguins especially. 17 different species of penguin. And of course, they're flightless. We looked at the adaptations of penguins. Many of you chose a penguin 
as your example of a vertebrate that was most adapted to life in the ocean. And certainly they are. We looked at a number of different adaptations from their beak to their flippers, their, their wings to their feet and their feathers, a whole bunch of different adaptations in terms of basically flying underwater and being in the water all the time. Very different than most birds. And then there's also some a, a number of adaptations, not just for swimming around in the water, but for dealing with the cold. Because it's certainly a requirement in Antarctica. It's really, really cold. And if you don't leave, so these migrate, they, they, they move seasonally, but not great distances. So they're still subject to the cold. So they're present in very large numbers to giant colonies. These penguins, some of you may have seen on TV, but what do they do with the cold? We looked at some of the mechanisms you find in polar bears. Well, penguins can employ some of the same strategy, some of the same adaptations for dealing with cold. In terms of their behavior, saw there are some behavioral differences with polar bears. Seasonally, they migrate, they can curl up to conserve heat. Well, these penguins, they can bask like reptiles do to a certain degree, warm up their bodies. But they can also, they huddle together like those, that big giant mass that I showed you before in this huddling picture there. They huddle together and the penguins that are in the inside can conserve a huge amount of heat. And in terms of insulation, not surprisingly, they have some insulation as well. They don't have hair, but they have feathers. And they don't have blubber, but they have uh, adipose tissue, fat, basically, that's a good insulator. So they have some insulation, two different types of insulation. And they also have countercurrent circulation with their feet so that they can sit on the ice and they, they don't melt the ice. So the extremity, the extreme parts of their feet are cold and the warmer part of their body, the warmer part of their extremities is closer to their, their body core. So we looked at this with the marine mammals earlier in terms of some characteristics that they have. So penguins, very adapted to the marine environment and very adapted to this cold environment as well. So those penguins 
obviously very entertaining, charismatic. And uh, if you go to aquariums, in, including the Mystic Aquarium, I think there, there's penguins all over the place. They're they're very common, very entertaining, popular display species for aquaria. And you find those a lot of different places, a lot of different aquaria. Well, the last thing that I want to talk about that really is more limited to the Antarctic than the Arctic. There isn't so much of a an equivalent in the Arctic as there is in the Antarctic. But there's this family of fish, the Nototherinidae, Thinoidae, that uh, are these ice fish that uh, have these different characteristics. Basically, they have antifreeze in their bodies. And there's a couple of different forms of this antifreeze. There's glycerol, which which won't freeze, and there's uh, these proteins. Some of the proteins are just regular proteins, and some of them are glycoproteins, so they have a, a carbohydrate that's attached to them as well. And so in the, the tissue of these fish, they contain these antifreeze compounds, and it prevents the formation of ice crystals in their body. In fact, their bodies can be super cool. Their bodies can be colder than seawater. They can be colder where normally, if they didn't have these antifreeze prop proteins in their bodies, then their water in their body would freeze. But they're even colder than the temperature at which water freezes. So there's one of those fish in the picture. And then down there in the below you see this uh, rate of enzyme activity, these different fish in this family, and you can see that they, they, their body temperature goes all the way down below zero, super cooled. And if you're familiar with the, with the, the ocean, we've looked at the temperature of the ocean. Some places it's really, really cold. Two degrees Celsius. So this is zero degrees, and as you probably know, that's the temperature at which water freezes. But with these antifreeze compounds that they have in their body, they can avoid freezing. It's a really uh, unique, and within this family anyway, it's widespread adaptation for tolerating these very, very cold waters. So that takes us through all these different marine ecosystems. We started with some very close to shore, went out into the open ocean, and then recently these highly specialized, somewhat uh, harsh environments, extreme environments that require a certain level of adaptation to be able to survive there. There's a lot of marine organisms that live there, but they have certain characteristics that enable them to survive. So the last part of this course, for the next two days, for Friday's lecture and Monday's lecture, we're going to talk about humans and marine ecosystems. Now, you can take entire courses. You can major in marine affairs, as some of you are, which is really what this falls into. But there's so many humans on Earth, and, and humans have such a big influence on other things that uh, extends all over the world. Pollutants, climate change, harvesting, habitat destruction, all kinds of different factors influence other organisms. And a lot of those organisms are marine organisms. So that's what we're going to focus our attention on on the very last two lectures of this course.